before he goes. Uh, we've then got Ellie Harwich, uh, who's the head of digital and tech innovation here at Reform, uh, and one of the co-authors of the report with uh, Kate Laycock. <coughs> Uh, here I've got uh, Dr. Naveen uh, Ramachandran, who's Honorary Senior Lecturer at the UCL Centre for Health Informatics uh, and a consultant radiologist at UCL Hospital. Uh, and then Maxine uh, McIntosh, who's uh, studying uh, for a PhD in data science uh, uh, and is, uh, at the Far Institute uh, and is mining, mining medical records for early predictors of dementia, is that right? Uh, and she's also the co-founder of One Health Tech. So I think you've got a really interesting panel, but also looking at the, the list of the audience, actually all of you know far more than I think even we do, so I'm very keen to bring you in. What I hope to do, if it's okay, that the, the event is scheduled to run until midday, but I'd like to run till quarter past 12 if that's okay, because it was originally cut off because we thought Norman had to leave at midday, but given he's leaving early anyway, <laughs> I think we want to carry on the conversation. If any of you do need to leave, obviously please uh, feel free to go. I should also say, this is not Chatham House, uh, partly because we're live streaming, so you know, <laughs> everything will be attributed. Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, I think the hashtag is AI Health, uh, and uh, I'll just hand over now to Norman to kick off. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Heaton. Uh, is that it sort of maps out a very practical way forward. The steps that actually have to be taken, the building blocks, for the NHS being able to exploit, in the best possible sense of the word, the extraordinary potential of technology, of algorithms, of artificial intelligence more generally. Um, uh, and these building blocks, I think, are of critical importance. The brutal truth is that they're not in place yet. Uh, and if we are to ensure that the NHS, and therefore patients in this country, are to benefit uh, from uh, the potential of this technology. Um, following the advice of this report, I think, is going to be of critical uh, importance. Uh, one of the things that I became acutely aware of as Minister is that governments often are not good at the implementation uh, part of uh, their job. They're very proficient at producing uh, bills and passing legislation on the whole, sometimes they're not, um, but actually making things happen on the ground to make a difference to people's lives often actually falls short. Uh, and I think that's particularly true in health, where we've seen endless reforms of various sorts, uh, which by and large fall way short of uh, their declared uh, intent and potential. Uh, and so actually mapping out a practical way forward uh, and then focusing on doing it uh, is of critical importance. Now, uh, Hita mentioned that we're in the middle of an inquiry on the uh, science and technology select committee. It's great to see Stephen Metcalf uh, here, who was my predecessor as chair uh, of this committee. Uh, his tenure falling cruelly short because of a general election, uh, but he's stayed on the committee, which is great. Uh, to have his uh, expertise and experience to contribute to our work uh, and we work I think very closely uh, together and uh, the work we are doing I think is also of uh, value because we are looking at uh, uh, the extraordinary <coughs> growth in the youth, use of algorithms across a whole range of public policy areas uh, but including uh, in health and this launch is very timely because next Tuesday uh, we have uh, our next hearing session on this inquiry and it will be focusing on the application of algorithms and AI in healthcare. And Ellie will be a witness, uh, <laughs> as luck would have it, uh, in that uh, inquiry session. And Heaton was there in the first session of this inquiry, so I'm surrounded by expert witnesses, which makes me very frightened. Um, <laughs> But uh, we will be looking uh, critically at both the risks involved uh, in this, uh, the application of this technology, uh, and in healthcare, of course, the absolute importance of public reassurance, of a sense of uh, ensuring that there is trust, uh, that their highly confidential data is being properly used within the system, both within the NHS, but also 
in terms of relationships between the NHS and outside organisations. If we don't secure the public trust, then the whole thing will fail. It, it's just a condition precedent uh, for anything else happening. And we've already seen problems in that regard uh, in the past with care.data and so forth. So uh, that is of critical importance. Uh, the ethics of how this is uh, applied is of critical importance and is addressed uh, in this report. The importance of ensuring that the NHS benefits financially from the opportunities that lie ahead and therefore of course the patients uh, that the NHS use benefiting will be of enormous importance and that again overlaps to public trust. If the public decides uh, that the benefit, the financial benefit is all uh, being realised by others, by perhaps uh, commercial organisations outside this country, again there will be a loss of trust. So we have to navigate our way through this incredibly uh, carefully. But I think uh, the prize is also incredibly important to keep our mind on. The prize is twofold, that first of all we achieve better outcomes and that is absolutely realisable, both in terms of being better at uh, preventing ill health. So all of these uh, wearables that many of us in this room will be uh, using already, collecting an extraordinary, staggering amount of data the whole time, but how we can deploy this to prevent ill health, to maintain a healthy community for a public health purpose, uh, the ability to combat Obesity, for example, the ability also to confront issues relating to mental health. These are enormous opportunities that lie ahead of us, but also not just in the preventing of ill health, but in the better prognosis of outcomes and in the diagnosis uh, of conditions. Uh, the ability to diagnose much more accurately than humans on their own are capable of. That is the potential uh, that lies ahead of us. And so this prize, first of all, of better outcomes for the people of this country and beyond uh, is an enormous one that is worth pursuing. But the other prize is also worth focusing on because we are, uh, as we all know, facing uh, a great public debate in this country about the fragility of the NHS, about the uh, strain that the whole system is under uh, and about whether it is sustainable um, uh, uh, through these very difficult times. And uh, the exciting potential here is that we can use, make better use of public resources uh, with the advantage of technology. Uh, we can make better use in terms of the organisation of resources uh, in delivering healthcare. We can make better use in faster, more accurate diagnosis so that we can then pinpoint the condition and apply the right approach uh, more quickly. Uh, and uh, indeed, if you think about something like sepsis, someone was telling me uh, a while ago that I think we lose something like 45,000 people every year to sepsis. There is the potential somewhere down the track of AI reducing uh, that awful death toll, uh, but also, of course, along the way, saving the system a large amount of money. So this is of vital importance in the debate about the sustainability of the health system in an ageing society, as well as the importance of achieving better outcomes. But I would end by addressing, in a sense, uh, the obstacle that is in the way uh, which this uh, report absolutely focuses on. Uh, because these gains will not simply be realised by us all standing back and watching as technology uh, takes its course. We have to organise uh, to do that, and we have to actually also invest to do that. And the state of the NHS, as it is at the moment, in terms of its digital capability, is a million miles away from where it needs to be if we are to realise uh, the potential of this technology. Uh, 
too much data is dirty. It's not clean, clear uh, data. It's collected not on a consistent uh, approach so that everything can be properly comparable. Uh, if poor data goes into uh, the technology, then the outcomes from that technology are flawed. And so uh, the need to get that data sorted in the NHS, the need to ensure that the whole system is digitalized. The fact that we still do not connect in many places the GP surgery to the A to the A and E department to the ambulance service. Uh, we will not realise the potential of this if we don't make the upfront investment in order to ensure that we can then realise the potential of the data, this vast, rich stock of data that is potentially available to us. And it's one of those cases which, of course, has been recognised by industries across the economy that sometimes in order to become more efficient and to realise the opportunities of technology, you have to invest up front in order to do that. And the government and the NHS needs to recognise that. So it's a mixture, a combination of upfront investment, but critically of organisation. And the practical steps set out in this report are of enormous value in guiding the NHS to the goal that we can achieve. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks, Norman, for an inspiring vision, but also uh, notes of caution uh, about where we need to think this through. Also, for sticking perfectly to your 10 minutes. Oh, no, 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 no. Purely by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie, the pressure's on you now. Okay. Five minutes, uh, just Five to kind of give us a sense of uh, some of the headlines from the report. I will, I will. Um, so I firstly wanted <clears throat> sorry, to thank you all for being here, and I wanted to thank our panel as well, and Ethan for chairing. Um, so I'm guessing, as most of you won't have had the time to have read the report, I was thinking of giving you a sort of five-minute condensed version of what is in the paper, and a lot of the themes have already been picked up um, by Norman. But before I start, I just wanted to take a couple of seconds to uh, thank Nazarin and John, who are here um, in the audience, um, for their continued support with this paper. And as you will see from, I guess, the sort of papers that were placed on your chair, they were part of the advisory board um, for this paper. Um, so as Heaton mentioned, I think most of you have way more expertise than a lot of us um, in terms of the potential applications of AI in healthcare. Um, so I won't spend too long talking about that side of the project, but I just wanted to mention sort of two examples that I found sort of quite interesting in the research that we did um, that show basically how AI can increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the healthcare system. The first one has to do with the case of mammograms, and um, well, basically women over the age of 50 are advised every three years to have uh, a mammography scan to screen for breast cancer. Um, and basically studies have shown that the rate of false positives is about 50%, so basically 50% of women are being told you might have cancer when they actually don't. Um, when these sort of same scans are read by an AI, results are produced 30 times faster with an accuracy rate of 99%. Um, and then another example, which I think is, is sort of quite interesting, I guess most of you will have seen, um, uh, there was a sort of news release a, a few weeks ago about the fact that 750 additional routine operations could be carried out within the NHS if planning was just better, if we were just better at scheduling. Um, so there, I guess we see a sort of perfect use case for intelligent sort of virtual assistants or, or any sort of type of intelligent um, planners. Um, but I guess the main point that we wanted to make was that none of this cool, amazing, amazing sort of snazzy things will happen if the implementation challenges are not addressed. Um, and so we highlighted sort of three broad categories of challenges in the paper. One is around improving buy-in. The other one is a get around getting data rights, as uh, Norman had mentioned. And the third one, which is quite a big one, is around the ethics of building AI systems in healthcare. So around improving buy-in, I won't sort of talk too much about it, as um, Norman mentioned quite a lot, but it is really about increasing both the public and um, the doctor's sort of trustworthiness in AI systems and increase the trustworthiness of data sharing mechanism. Getting data right is really about getting the right type of data in the right format, so in the machine-readable format, and basically <coughs> moving 
the NHS from a sort of heavily paper-based system onto uh, a digital system. The point around data quality that Norman made is also extremely important. Um, as most of you will know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and it's also extremely important to improve the um, security of access to data. Then the challenges that we identified in looking at the ethics of building AI systems in healthcare, I think the first one is a question of the fairness in partnerships with the private sector. It's you know, obviously really amazing that companies are getting involved in developing incredible solutions to improve people's outcomes, but there's also a question of how do we make sure that these partnerships will be mutually beneficial on the long run? How do we make sure that, I don't know, five years down the line, they don't turn around and say, we're gonna charge a lot of money for this when these algorithms would have never been able to be developed without the use of patient data. Um, and then around the certification procedures, obviously, um, there are questions around how the current regulation should be updated, what type of pre-release trials should be carried out, um, how to regulate online algorithms that continuously update the more data you uh, feed into them, what type of transparency, transparency sorry, or explainability is, is required for AI systems, and how do we make sure that we also minimize bias in them so that we don't further entrench healthcare inequalities and variation in terms of outcomes and that we actually make AI work for all of us. So that's it for me and those were the sort of questions raised in the paper and it's available online if you want to read the full <coughs> 58 pages of it. <laughs> for keeping that uh, so brief but there's a lot in the paper I do uh, commend it to you for, for re reading uh, after you leave um, can I uh, open up whilst we've still got Norman can I suggest that we have a few questions directly for Norman and then we've got some very patient panellists here we will be opening up for a wider kind of Q&A and discussion with the whole panel shortly but I do want to make the most of Norman's time here so uh, pe people interested in so we've got one can I take two or three another one there I'm going to start with you. Uh, we've got four, so start here, there, there, and then the person at the back. Okay, um, I'm Ian Cohen, the Programme Director for Digital Health London, and the question is to both Norman and Eleanor. So in what you've just described um, in terms of what needs to be in place uh, for this to work, one of the things that I didn't hear was around skills. Um, so skilled workforce, and I believe that I know there's a lot of work going on around skills, uh, building a digital, digitally ready um, workforce. But I think there's probably additional skills that are required um, to really embrace uh, artificial intelligence. And I wondered whether you had a perspective on that. Great. So, something on skills. Uh, so um, Owen Johnson, I'm in the Leeds Institute for Data Analytics, which is part of the university. Um, Norman, I thought you. Presentation was great. The, the, an area you didn't touch on, I thought it might be interesting for your comments on, was the international competitiveness of UK PLC versus all the other global initiatives coming out of the commercial space and other countries. And I just think that might be interesting to sort of see how where do we fit uh, and where do we want to fit in that space. Great. Uh, and then uh, Danny Buckland, I'm a health journalist. Uh, Norman said that the prior existence were best and organised. I just wonder if there's anything the government should be doing that you think that it's not doing at the moment. Great. And then fourth person up. Yeah, David Chumbo from uh, IPSoft. Uh, there were great insights in uh, this paper. Uh, and in particular, I was struck by the figure on page 28 about ah. the circle from the virtual circle from data to action taken, oh, right. insights, <laughs> actions taken, and back to data. Uh, and I was wondering if you'd uh, researched the bottleneck and the actions taken. Uh, because there's a big risk of generating lots of new insights. But as we know, we've got an overwhelmed uh, workforce right now. And how might agents be able to act on the insights? And how uh, AI can be used to uh, achieve, uh, to enable them? Okay. Great. So what I'll do, if it's okay, is I'll ask Norman to address the first three questions. So skills, global kind of fit, and what should government be doing? 
uh, and then if you need to escape at that point, uh, and then, then, then we will open up... Before any more difficult questions, we'll pick up page 28 and the bottleneck and, uh, and the wider issues uh, with, the, with the full panel after that. So, Norman. Thank God I don't have to deal with page 28. <laughs> Um, so, well, I think you're absolutely right on skills. Uh, it has to be a central element of the uh, strategy uh, that we uh, now uh, implement. And I think at the moment what's happening is, and I think the report picks this up, that it's haphazard. It's down to uh, individual providers about how much progress is being made. So we're seeing some fascinating and impressive um, advancements in some places, but it is very haphazard. And it, there needs to be a sort of national imperative, and that involves a, a, a training program and, and involving uh, all of the different elements of uh, train, education and training through Health Education England. They have a big role to play here to make sure that this is embedded in the training program of clinicians, of managers, and so forth. So I think it, you're absolutely right to highlight that. Uh, on international competitiveness, well, that, that, it's a fascinating. Uh, area and of course the industrial strategy uh, just published through the white paper uh, does address this uh, and uh, the government's decision to um, increase uh, spend on R&D um, is important and uh, valu valuable. Um, it could be, I mean I, I talked to Greg Clark about this the other day, it, 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 it could I think be more <coughs> ambitious and I think he would like more uh, investment made. I mean, ultimately, what we're aiming to do, what the government's aiming to do, is to get to the OECD average in 10 years. And of course, that's the OECD average now. It will probably have changed uh, in 10 years' time. So, uh, is it ambitious enough for this country if we want to be a global leader in these technologies? Uh, so, um, I, I think it's very good that it's recognised uh, and prioritised through the industrial strategy. Uh, but I think po probably it needs to be uh, more ambitious. But I think it's also worth of this. There is a wonderful opportunity that this country has with the NHS. Uh, it, it's not necessarily unique, but it's unusual in the extent to which we have a whole system uh, which could deliver the most remarkably rich data uh, for uh, application of these technologies. So there is a massive prize there for this country I think if we get it right, I hope that makes sense uh, to you, Ellie, as well. Um, and uh, what should government uh, be doing? Well, I don't want to uh, preempt the uh, uh, outcome of our inquiry. Uh, that would be wrong for me to do so. I get criticised by Stephen for a start. Uh, but I think um, it's clear that within healthcare, there needs to be. Uh, this national imperative, the sense that we shouldn't just be leaving it to the individual providers across a very diverse system. This needs to be driven nationally. It needs to be recognised as a clear priority by NHS England. Simon Stevens has talked about the importance of AI, but I don't think we're there yet in terms of it uh, actually being realised as a priority for the system as a whole. Uh, a lot of people sort of complain about the Stalinist nature of the NHS, but sometimes there are advantages in being able to potentially drive something forward, uh, and we must do that, I think, in this case. <coughs> and then, so far as government is concerned, making sure that the recommendations of this report are uh, recognised and pursued, particularly around the ethics of uh, uh, data sharing and data security, uh, around absolutely addressing this risk of bias. Um, you know, uh, there is a real danger with algorithms that you reinforce existing biases rather than uh, uh, eradicating them. We have, it has the potential to eradicate bias, human bias, but it can inadvertently reinforce bias. Uh, and so having a, a good, clear regulatory framework within healthcare to address these vitally important ethical issues which will maintain public confidence uh, I think is uh, incredibly important. And the final point is simply, I'm afraid, cash. There needs to be the investment uh, in getting the digitalisation of the NHS sorted out 
in order for the NHS to become more efficient and to achieve better outcomes further down the track. Thank you Have I much. contradicted everything? No. <laughs> 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 yeah, thank you. 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 Thank
yeah, the benefit is about being able to, I guess, reassure the patient as to who has access to the type of, of, of data, make sure that the way that data is accessed is compliant with, with current regulation. I think that's that's a really sort of interesting benefit. I know Naveen knows a lot about this, but yeah, I'll bring does. you in later. Yeah. But Norman, do you, do you want to say anything? No, I, I don't think I've got anything to add to what's already been said. I mean, if you have thoughts <coughs> or ideas that you want to feed in to me, then please uh, do so. I'm always keen to hear and that. That message goes out to anyone else in this room. If you think that there are things that, as a, a committee conducting an inquiry now on this, if you think there are things that we need to know, then please make contact with us. Uh, although there's a deadline for written submissions, which is way past, uh, don't worry about that. If, if you think there's something really important to quickly put in, put it in, uh, and it can be considered by us. But on that note, I'm conscious I want to try and get in at business questions on something wholly different about the treatment of people with a diagnosis of personality disorder, which is another vitally important subject. So I better go. Great. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you. Right, so we've had a couple of uh, very patient panellists on this side, in particular Maxine. That means they've been slightly less patient, I must say. Uh, so what I'd like to do is offer them both a couple of minutes just to kind of give their sort of the direction that they're coming from. And then after that, we'll open up for a, a, quite an interactive Q&A uh, and comment session where you'll get a chance to, to, to give a good week. So Maxine, a couple of minutes. So kind of, what, where are you coming from on all of this? Um, I suppose there are probably three main things for me. So one is, um, to Yinka's point, is the skills. So uh, I'm starting my journey in data science and healthcare. My background is in neuroscience and health economics. Um, and my trajectory is, I think, a very common trajectory for people working at the intersection of, of health and data. Um, I think the reality of working, say, in a research environment is that you make mistakes. Your um, information governance knowledge is not tip-top. Um, it's very difficult to get access to some of the data you need, and you beg, steal, and borrow wherever you can. And um, so as much as it's fantastic having lots of schemes and regulations and ideas in place, um, when you're starting in that journey, I think that uh, you really are learning as you go. And uh, lots of people are going to be in that boat. Um, and we just need to take, I think, a bit more care in how we educate and how we train people and, and also have a bit more support of those. Who has and the reality is that most people don't have all three. I think the second thing for me is really about um, commercial transparency. Um, I think there's been a lot of, um, I'm sure many of us have sat on the tube and seen adverts of particular companies. Um, I'm sure many of us have read all the front pages about DeepMind. And I think that the reality is that in an environment where it is very complex, um, lots of organizations have received a slap on the wrist. I think every single health IT supplier has had significant breaches in the past. Um, the only response from a commercial organisation is uh, transparency and honesty. And I think that organisations that are not open with what happens inside their black boxes will pay the price quite soon. And the third one has escaped me because I wasn't planning on having a random right. well, That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. Those are two very fine points. Uh, it should be said, uh, other data monopolies are available other than the ones that have already been mentioned. So. <laughs> Right, so I talk quite a lot, but I talk quietly, so there's more <laughs> blessings. Um, I'm a radiologist at UCH, and for the last few years I was looking at data modelling and semantic interoperability of systems, which basically means we're talking about the data quality here, and how you can interpret medical data. So that's how it started, because I was in charge of setting up a multidisciplinary team for kidney cancer in North London, and you look at how information flows between systems, and see how bad it is and then see what you can do about it. So that was the start. Over the last few years, I've been working with UCL Computer Sciences to build different medical IT systems, mainly as proof of concepts. But again, getting an idea of how, how different systems from uh, just basic UI work, see how people interact with systems towards more complex, like machine learning systems and image analysis. So you get a flavor for all of the different aspects of, of the technology. Uh, in the last year or so, I've been working with distributed ledgers with uh, UCL Center for Blockchain Technology and something called IOTA, which is a new distributed ledger, looking at GDPR and sharing of data between people and how you, you look at consent and the common order. Maybe not although, maybe because. Yeah, so I, I think you can see, so from my side, thank you. 
<laughs> so I'm not a complete, I'm not a pessimist, but it comes down to game theory and incentivization. And as I see the current patterns of, of, of how the market operates and how these systems come to be and how they're developed, you get a bit more pessimistic on what the eventual outcome will be. So every even biggest ML proponent will tell you that it, the technology has the power to uproot society and to change how everything is. And I think most people in this room kind of know that. Do you want to just explain the ML? Or oh, so that's machine learning, or AI, or whatever you want to call it. So there's a whole bunch of different technical and non-technical names. Most it's, people here will be familiar, yeah. but not absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so everyone here kind of knows the potential, and everyone kind of knows that there could be a reordering of the structure of society. And when it comes to government, I think governments are starting to understand that they can be overthrown by it. Uh, let's have a look at Brexit, and let's have a look at the American vote. And this, although you think it may be due to society changing, I kind of take a different view on it. So if they can reflect to you what reality is, they can control how you behave. And I think we've seen that to an extent, and that's kind of what scares me. Um, and when it comes to medicine, I think we're in that position where if we let that data escape into the world, especially things around diagnostics and population surveillance and population health, the same algorithms are going to tell us what to do, and maybe it's not particularly the right thing, and there may be incentives, well, bad incentives behind it. I think we just have to be a bit cautious about that. So that's where I come into this, and I say, yep, it has the potential to do good, but also look at what it possibly could do, and we can touch on all the different points, because uh, there's a lot more to explore in, in each of those bits. Okay. Let me just ask the, the two panelists, other panelists to respond to this idea. The sort of concentration of power, the kind of data monopolies, is this something that's of concern to you, Maxine? Yeah, massively from a skills capacity. Um, I say this quite a lot, but you know, I get paid 16 grand to write algorithms by myself without any supervision, um, uh, without any colleagues. Just that's the life of a PhD student. And if you look at the uh, salary uh, imbalance in academia, no wonder there's a massive brain drain from academia into industry. It was great to see in the industrial strategy uh, something around having that as a more porous boundary. And I think that's pretty much the only solution, um, that we are going to see a concentration of intellectual capital going into the commercial sector, because you know, when push comes to shove, you've got to pay your rent, you've got families. And I think that um, until academia starts to modernise a little bit, and it's great to see that health, um, HDR UK, which is the new data science National Data Science Institute, there's a big focus on team science. And I think things like that that are starting to help academia modernise and help make that boundary a bit more porous between the academic world and commercial sector might help. But um, the concentration of power by uh, they can produce. And I think while d during my interviews, I hadn't sort of quite realised, I guess, how um, they're just really sort of quite incredible research centers that they're creating within with salaries that obviously can't compete with the salaries in universities. Um, I think that, yeah, it definitely is, is somewhat problematic in that sense. Right, let's open up to our distinguished audience. Uh, so we've got one there. I'll take, I'll take again a, a batch of about three and then we'll come back to the panel. So other questions, second one there. One more? I've got a hand at the back, which I, yeah, whoever it is that, ah, it's Natalie. Natalie, why don't you kick off, because I can barely see you, and then I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. Will you stand up, just so, for the acoustics, so that we can... Um, and so my question sort of follows on from that previous discussion, and that's about unintended consequences. So, the best intentions for AI in healthcare are all about, you know, benefits to patients, benefits to Workflows, helping improve um, yeah, efficiency and so on, and cost down, etc. All great intentions, but as we've seen with quite a few AI applications, unintended consequences happen, and uh, algorithms don't quite do what you intend them to do. They may you know, create biases and, and those sorts of things. So I just wondered if the panel had any thoughts on how some of those unintended consequences could potentially be anticipated more, how thinking could be sort of baked into earlier stages of the design. Tucker from Brunel University. I'm a computer scientist and AI researcher. 
Um, I'd just first like to say I completely agree with the panel about the imbalance between the private sector and the academic sector. And we lost several PhD students to various companies um, because of the, the difference in salary and obviously the attractiveness of working for a sexy company. Um, what I'm interested in is to what degree does the use of open source approaches um, to software, developing software, and enforcing and regulating um, algorithms that have to be open source, would that be seen as a, like a, a relatively simple solution to actual system? It's sharp intakes of breath uh, around the room. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> like, uh, Claudia Rubin from Obsidian, a health policy uh, company. I'm just curious about some, um, some utopias, if in the course of your research, you, anybody on the panel wants to sort of draw our attention to some case studies of where currently there are some best practice models that um, either globally or of course in the UK that we can learn from. Great. That's, um, so we've got uh, how do we mitigate unintended consequences, presumably bad ones, or at least uh, spot some good ones before they happen. Uh, what, how can we bring more transparency to algorithms through open source publishing? Uh, uh, and uh, what's working, what's happening already, uh, as opposed to having a very abstract conversation? Maxine, do you want to kick off on any of those, uh, or all of those, if you like? Yeah, I, th I think the, the unintended consequences, I think, is quite tricky, because I think the most, that could be quite a good reason for, for total stasis sometimes. Um, so I prefer to see it as, uh, you know, the opportunity cost of not doing something. So I think the big thing is um, uh, paperless is, is a really good example, I think. There's lots of examples as to people saying, oh, no, but we couldn't possibly go digital because, I mean, even anecdotally, I wasn't given, uh, I wasn't emailed my electronic health record because of um, potential data breaches, but I was allowed to be given on a piece of paper. When I said, what if I leave it on the bus? They said, oh, well, then that's up to you. So I do think that there's, I do think there's that, that the articulation of the opportunity cost of not doing something, I think is actually probably how it should happen. Part of the way I believe in which that can be done is um, you know, through organisations like outcomes-based healthcare that you know, Rupert and Nasrin are running. And it's about kind of much clever articulation of outcomes and, and just to enrich in what our goalposts are. And it's not one, specifically one biomarker, but it's about the things that really matter to patients. And I, part of that does require, I think, a slightly more intelligent um, discussion and definition about what an outcome is. Um, to Alan's point, I mean, I completely agree. I think one term that I really appreciated was um, a article in the BMJ written by Trish Greenhouse that talked about algorithmic generics. Um, so how do you look at um, an algorithm in the same sort of patent profile like a pharmaceutical product? Um, and it was taking that approach but, but translating it and, and the, the argument was for open source, but viewing it like an algorithmic generic and, and whether that can be an agenda that's pushed forward. Um, because the reality is that lots of organizations will train their algorithms on NHS data for a fraction of the cost and then sell it back to the NHS at a much higher price. So I do, I agree with you, Alan, I think that's pretty much the only solution to mitigate against that. Okay. Do, do you want to go first? Because I'm, yes, I'm up for yeah. a big round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think to back to... Yeah, so okay. back, back to Natalie's question, um, I, I, I guess I completely agree with what Maxine said, that it, it, is, it is about understanding what, what would be the cost of not sharing data, of not doing certain <coughs> things. Um, and there is some academic research in that, which I, I, I came across um, doing research in this paper, and it is actually quite interesting when you actually try to look at the costs of not sharing information within healthcare and, and what happens if you don't. Um, but I do, I do think as well that, you know, although you can't possibly map out all of the possible bad consequences and that in healthcare you need to, I guess, understand that whatever sort of procedures or systems that you put in place, there is um, a sort of margin of error and there will be risk. You can still, I think, ask yourself the question of what would be the sort of right way of stress testing models and making sure that, you know, you try to minimize bias as much as you possibly can or minimize the risk as much as you possibly can. So, I mean, you know, you, you won't be able to eliminate <coughs> it and you have to accept that it will exist, but I think that definitely sort of trying to develop somewhat of a framework where you try to minimize it would be um, an important one. Then, um, I guess, sort of back to Alan's question on the sort of um, d developing things open source. Um, 
I, I don't have a particularly strong view on that. The only thing that it made me think of was an article that Nick, Nick Bostrom uh, wrote on the openness of AI. And he basically goes through sort of different scenarios of um, how <coughs> writing things open source and, and um, having algorithms, I guess, sort of publicly published could um, have different benefits both in the short, medium, and long term. Yeah, I, can refer back to I have strong views on this, I will come back on it. it. <laughs> Not just yet. Let no, 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 our proper speakers come in before the chair starts abusing us. <laughs> so it, it, I think the three are very linked together. Um, so we, we're talking about what the potential is for harm. And there's, so there's classically a distinction made between narrow intelligence, which kind of does a, a task and does it repeatedly and does it well, versus general intelligence, which can take knowledge from one domain and transfer it to another, transfer that learning towards a super intelligence where we can't even comprehend what it's doing because it's beyond. It's like an ant trying to figure out what we're doing is us trying to figure out what the computer's doing. So people get stuck on that side of the spectrum. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go back to like the very simple stuff that's happening now, which is a narrow intelligence and how that's dangerous. And that comes down to constraints. So you can say, go and make paper clips. That's the example that's always given. But a, a better example is something like Disney's Fantasia, where if you watch this, Mickey Mouse saying to his brooms, fill up a cauldron full of water. And then he gets more brooms, and he doesn't constrain it. He just says, I want you to fill up this cauldron with water, brooms go off and do it, and very soon there's a flood, and the whole castle floods. And that's the moral of the story, unintended consequences. So. That's a badly constrained AI. So what? how do we constrain AIs properly? Well, it's hard because you can't exactly, like we said, we cannot tell what <coughs> bad things can be are gonna happen. So what do we constrain it to? We don't know yet. Are we actually trying to constrain it? Probably not because, and this is what it boils down to, it's the incentivization model. And this ties everything together is the current incentivization model tends to be venture capital. And your venture capital model says, right, here have two million, and now <coughs> get your model or your algorithm, train it for a year, and make it as efficient as possible. And then we'll compare all the, the models, and the one that does best gets bought. So that's great. So what are you going to do in that year? Are you going to train it to be safe, or are you going to train it to be fill the cold enough the quickest so that you can? I'd say you do the latter. So that's already a bad start to it. Then what happens afterwards? So do these companies tend to, so if you look at venture capital exits, how people leave, how many of them actually take that on to their own company? Very few. The vast majority have a sell off to one of the big five companies. So again, you get a, a concentration of the same IP, very bad IP and very quite potentially dangerous IP, but still concentrated into the hands of a few people. So I think that's, if you can get rid of that, so if you said, similar, and I go further than the open source thing, I say, look, take out any IP within ML. And people go, and this is where people come back and say, you're stifling innovation. And I, and I counter and say, we're only stifling profit. Because I beg you that if we do that, there will be a slower rate of progress, but actually it may be better constrained AIs that come out of it. So, and everyone says, oh my God, people are dying. You could save a thousand lives next year. Well, they died last year. So what suddenly made an emergency this year that you have to do this when the potential dangers are so bad that it could affect society in that way? And that's what I'm saying, be a bit careful. Don't go down the hype, just say, okay, yes, we know there's a problem, let's deal with the problem. So I think that's a good approach. When it comes to open sourcing, that, now that's a bit more tricky in that when you have an algorithm, there's things like TensorFlow, there's a whole bunch of AI things out there, especially the deep learning stuff I'm talking about, the ones you can't predict. I can open source that, they have. What they won't open source is the, the, map, the models of the, the gradients, everything they've learned from it. And that's actually the very important stuff that we're giving to them. It's unlikely to be open source, and even if it was, can anyone audit it? Probably not. Because, and that's, that's another thing, the auditability of this, it sounds great in theory, we'll build these systems that are auditable. It's incredibly hard once you put something into a deep learning network to find out how it came to it, even with a few data points. Now put in a trillion data points into it and try and figure out what it did there. It's giving you an opinion and you have to take it as such. So going back to that, you have to be very wary that it's very, when it gets to the more complex systems, you can't really open source it meaningfully and you can't really audit it meaningfully.
what is best practice in this in other in other places I, I'd say bearing in mind those dangers and knowing what kind of dangers we're dealing with the best thing is to take the profit out of it and actually when it comes to the data rather than an institution like the NHS saying oh we'll give you the data please give us something back in return you actually put that data back in the hands of everyone so there's the my data movements happening around Europe which basically says everything that comes not just from your medical record because I think the medical record is a very small bit. What's much more powerful is maybe your GPS data and your browsing history it will tell me a lot more about you and your medical record than that's written in my actual NHS record. Yeah. <laughs> so places like Finland have realised that because I can declare like a sexual preference and then you look at my GPS data and my browsing history and I'll reveal something differently sometimes. Not me personally, actually. <laughs> but, uh, that's what I mean. It, it's things... There's a lot of detail in there which we will not declare to even people in authority, and it's in there within these records. And the way to mitigate against that is to put all of that, my data, into the hands of the patients so they decide who accesses it, who learns from it, and if there is anything learned from it, you can work cooperatively as a group, but how do you, how do you incentivize that whole group? How does a company, say, give something back to that group rather than negotiating with Wind up your rant. It's That's a good, it. good rant. <laughs> gone on a bit too long. Yeah. I, I, I'm just going to follow on on that uh, question about uh, open talks, but I'm conscious that all of the speakers have ducked the, the third question about where is this working. Yeah. We're getting into slightly kind of pessimistic territory. Maybe, maybe that's uh, that's where we need to be. But uh, I am going to come back to each of you and ask you if you've got an example of something that you think is is working. So uh, you've got a minute to think about it. Uh, just following on on this question of open source approaches, I mean, again, I, I, like, like Naveen, I distinguish between the sort of quite simple applications of really statistics, which you, you can, if you make it open source, you can predict what will happen. And in a sense, there's nothing much new going on there. People might be calling it AI, but I think it's not. I think it's simple statistics. It's the new deep learning, machine learning stuff, which I think is uh, trickier if you make it open source, as you say. <coughs> what can you tell from it, uh, that's, that's the problem. Uh, but I think that there are other things you can do. You can be auditing outcomes uh, where you don't need to peer into the black box, you just look at who, who is benefiting and who is not from, from this. Uh, I think you can uh, also look at, you know, um, if you put dif different variables into the algorithm, at what point does it shift its decision making, as it were? So. Uh, maybe I should have not used the word open source. Maybe I should have said reproducibility. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's, it's yeah. just a bigger problem is in academia as in the commercial sector anyway. And I think there was a push for reproducibility within academia as well as you know, within yeah. government and within um, the commercial sector. That would start to address some of these issues. Uh, I think this is the live debate about how do you do that. As well. and the kind of final point that I would make is that, given we're talking about healthcare, this is where, you know, we've seen the public sector taken for a ride by the private sector many, many times. Uh, I think that the AI hype, the danger is that that will happen again. The NHS has to recognise the ones with the data are the ones in the position of power. Actually, there's a marketplace of people who will create algorithms, and they're selling it as a very sexy thing, but actually the ones who hold the data are the ones that are in the real position of power. So there's a procurement relationship which the NHS has for a moment which it really needs to use. And this is where, you know, what Royal Free did by just giving its data away in a really sort of stupid way. I mean, in all, at all sorts of levels, it was just really, really bonkers as far as I was concerned. Right, uh, we'll come back to, uh, where, where, give us an example of where something good is happening. Oh, so I, I think actually coming to that question is quite, quite a difficult one because if we're, I guess, sort of looking at the sort of new novel AI systems and not talking about sort of the more old school expert systems, um, a lot of the things that are being currently implemented are currently being trialed more than actually sort of rolled out. Um, so I, I, I'd rather err on the side of caution and not say that this is exactly how you should really do things because it, it is sort of, I guess, quite new. But may, maybe there's something that I haven't seen and I kind of still have I a different opinion. There's lots and lots of pilots. I mean, uh, Indra Joshua, who's sitting at the end of a row, I think probably has the best understanding of all national pilots going on at any time. I think there's lots of micro examples. Oh, so I mean, at UCL, I can think of five. I mean, one of them is predicting did not attend for um, uh, brain scans. Sorry, 
predicting de denotatens to people's uh, scanning equipments based on their brain scans. So two kind of physiological, non-sensically rated things. We're actually very able to predict whether someone's going to show up for a scan or not. Um, and the reason why that's fantastic is because you can send people reminders who you know are probably going to not show up or be late. Um, not very exciting, um, but potentially save quite a lot of money. There's lots of little schemes like that going on, but to an average point, it's very narrow intelligence. It's not scaled. Um, and uh, I mean, how many, off the top of your head, Indra, how many pilots do you reckon are going on at any one time? In the NHS? In the NHS. Uh, more than the NBA. Um, but I'd say over close to Oh, I'm 5,000. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Twitter hashtag is AI. <laughs> 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 they give us an example couple. of something that's kind of happening right now. So there's a couple of good things I think which, which it is good at doing. It's we, even now, before, it's, the rest I'm not saying abandon it. I'm saying there's got to be proper debate because what's happening right now is that let's steam ahead of it because we're going to fall behind the rest of the world because there's profits to be made. I'm saying stop and think about that in those. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, it's kind of proof of concept, and I think that's acceptable. When you've got a whole heap of data, you say, okay, I cannot see through this, mine through this, and give me a couple of examples, and then I will go and formally test it. And I think that's a very good, it's like a discovery phase, I think it's very good. What I don't like is where it says, we'll do the whole package for you. You don't worry about it. I'll just give you the answer, come back and you know. That's the bit I'm warning against. I think the rest is definitely a big role. Can I just ask a quick follow-on question? So, um you mentioned process optimization, you mentioned mammography at the start, and I think you mentioned CPR at the start. Um, are we far enough with any of these? Do we know enough about any of these to actually kickstart an adoption, some adoption across the NHS? Okay, so just hold, We're gonna, I'm going to bring a few more people okay. uh, in as well. So, uh, yeah, one at the back there, and then I've got two here. Uh, Rob Bacargo, PwC. Um, there's obviously a huge number of bodies involved in this report, the MHRA, the CQC, NHS England, NHS Digital. We've also got the APPG, the House of Lords Select Committee on AI. Uh, we've got Norman's uh, Science and Technology Committee. We've got the Centre of Data Ethics coming, the AI Council. Where's the locus of control and coordination going to be to make all this happen? I mean, presumably Norman would have been better to have answered that. Maybe Stephen could answer it for us. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so it's slightly controversial, not speaking on behalf of KPMG, <laughs> we're a risk company. But um, so data scientists, I would argue, just want to work on real world problems, right? And improve outcomes collaboratively with the NHS. But my experience of working and trying to access data and engage partners, like all the ones we've just heard about, is really difficult. And that might be because. Um, you know, who controls the data, who's the data controller, you know, all these other things. But I, I would argue that it's not all about profit. And actually, we're, we want to invest heavily with NHS partners and, and have an ecosystem because only by doing this kind of patchwork quilt of not KPMG or IBM or Microsoft or DeepMind who have their one way mirrors, but actually having this, um, this quilt and this ecosystem. But how do you start that? And it's, it's, I think it's fine to criticize the private sector. But then the other side is it, then engage us and tell us what we need to do to engage <coughs> you because we're trying. And that's not just to make profit. I go to work to hopefully help people. Great. Okay. So I think uh, we're going to end with that round of questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so to come back to the panel, uh, what are the opportunities to just kind of scale and speed up what's already happening? Are we at that stage or, or not yet? Uh, when will we see uh, genetic sequences as, uh, as training data? There's a whole series of bodies mushrooming in this space. Where's the kind of locus of control? Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, how does the private sector engage in this agenda in a way that is uh, transparent and with sort of positive purpose as opposed to uh, you know, uh, being evil in some way? <laughs> Do you want to kick off? Then? Yes, I will. I will. Um, so I, I guess where we're there and in terms of scaling, I guess my opinion would be um, sort of going back to some of the things that Navin said, which is 
sort of very sort of narrow applications. So in certain types of image recognition, um, I think solutions can definitely be scaled and accuracy rates are there. Um, and in terms of also looking at, um, I guess, sort of solutions, simple solutions to improve the efficiency of process. And I guess sort of very narrow, um, I guess, sort of precise applications can start to be scaled up and then we can sort of see where things go and see how, how things are, are scaled. Um, then in terms of the loads of agencies that are created, um, I don't have an answer to that question, but I, I completely agree and it is definitely something that I found in the research. You know, we, I guess while we were researching, I was just like, oh my God, what are all of these sort of players and things within the NHS and then you sort of look beyond and, and then as we were writing, the industrial strategy came through and then all of the, and I was just like, oh wow. There's, I, I think there is a definite danger of sort of replicating remits. I think there's a lack of potential precision as to what are the exact remits and powers of, of all of these agencies. And I think government should definitely potentially clarify things a bit and rationalize it because I don't, I don't see the necessity for so many bodies. Um, I cannot answer the question on genetic sequencing. That's right. I'm just watching. Pick up the ones you want to. Um, yeah, and private I think, sector how how can it engage? Yes, or? how can it engage? Um, I think I think it should definitely engage, and it's something that I, I mean I don't think that we can make a lot of these sort of frameworks that we recommend in the paper work without engagement of the private sector. And so I think to me is you know sort of meetings, conversations like here, or you know just contributing in in, in your own way as as to how how you think that. You know, you could stress test models or what, what is your opinion on the type of regulation that could also be useful for you in terms of um, accessing data and then, I guess, sort of seeing with the sort of information governance frameworks that you have within the NHS if, if there can be a balance that can be found. Okay, I'll start with this thing, and that's actually quite close to, to my day-to-day -day work because that's imaging, starting with the mammography stuff. We're seeing a lot of these papers come out, and I was warning about this for the last two, three years, because what you have to kind of look at the actual evidence behind it. So another great paper came out saying uh, AI outdoes a radiologist in looking at chest x-rays for the nose. And it's a, in essence, what they did was take their best 25% and compare it with an unfiltered thing from a general population here, and they said it did 2% better, and only looking at pneumonia and nothing else on the film. So those are the kind of things that makes for a good paper, but actually it's not scalable. I think it'd be a long way before we get there. Mm -hmm. Then also you have to go, it, here's another bit about it, is all these things to, to mitigate against litigation. Everything's gonna come out as decision support. Mm -hmm. So it'll be like me and decision support. Mm -hmm. But actually at what point do you overrule decision support? Yeah. And if you overrule decision support, do you yeah. get sued? Yeah. In which case it's making the decision for you. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of issues, ethical issues and mm -hmm. technological issues we need to deal with there. I think that's the bit we can kind of like gloss over. There. So yeah. it, it's, it's coming, but it'll be a long way away, mm -hmm. I think. The, the genetic stuff, there's already, and this is kind of scary, is that <coughs> lots of, so there's, I was asked to be involved in something in India, uh, probably because I'm Indian, uh, and also involved with some of the genomics in, in uh, work at UCLH, but it's happening in lots of places where people, states are also asking for their, their populations genotype to be sequenced and kept for future use. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure what to think about this because there's potential for good, but on the other hand, you have things like 23andMe, which told you how Neanderthal you were, and then sold all your data for a few billion to, to pharma companies for research. So that there's a balance of the good versus the evil, and actually, is every decision you make from this point going to be referenced against your genotype? And go, oh yeah, yeah, and I haven't did that because of that, that gene there. That, that's the thing, it's like, how much do you get over interpretation of that? So I think we have to be a bit careful with that. When it comes to what were the... Uh, sorry, so... Uh, oh yeah, the responsible bodies. I think it's going to be difficult, because even in the UK we can say, yeah, this person's in charge, but actually AI and data exists within a multinational yeah, setting. Yeah. So we can do whatever we want, but actually there's a bigger EU setting and there's a bigger global setting. I'd rather catch this within terms of what the EU does. Even though we may be slightly out of it, I think they're actually doing some very good stuff around GDPR and trying to take control of it. The the last question. The private sector. The private sector. Yeah. No. I, I, I'm not anti thingy. I, I'm I'm involved in lots of these ventures myself. I'm just saying be a 
a bit more cautious about how you approach it. Yeah. The, the, the difficulty with data access at the minute all stems from care.data. Mm -hmm. So, I, and this is what really scared me about the DeepMind stuff, because I think we saw a very similar situation when it came to tissue research, where you had the Alder Hay Children's Hospital scandal, where people found that they were using children's tissue without consent, and then suddenly clamped down. And actually, the, uh, the research in the country took a massive hit, because it, the, the country lost trust. The same thing happened with the care.data debacle a few years ago, and people went, we don't trust you anymore with it. And then just as we're gaining trust again, the Air War Free thing happened, and there was a big scandal. <laughs> Scaling. So anecdotally, a lot of the um, startups on the One Health Fit Network who are working in the back end of kind of clerical tasks in the NHS very much are saying we're scaling up the boring admin, for example, appointment booking, as a way of getting into a system, learning the system, building the trust between individuals, and then we plan on being involved for clinical care. So um, that is anecdotally, but I do think that that's the way that a lot of these small organisations are looking to scale up is through the kind of lower risk but easy wins that doesn't involve kind of uh, sensitive patient information. Um, the bodies involved, um, I, I would agree. Unfortunately, I think that uh, no one body has the right skill. Um, I think that you know, data scientists will have one view, regulators will have another view, clin clinicians will have another view, and unfortunately, they kind of do all meet each other. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I do think that any one body doesn't have the right skills to be able to answer that question. And um, you could argue that it just goes back to the patient. I'm not entirely sure how that manifests, though. And in terms of the genetic information, um, I don't work in genetics, um, so I'm afraid I don't think we're comfortable answering that question. Um, but uh, I do think that the smorgasbords of bodies um, and the sheer volume, I'm sure everyone in this room is sitting on at least three, four, five committees in this space. Um, I think people will continue to discuss until someone is willing to kind of stick their neck above the, the precipice. Well volunteered, my nice nah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up uh, uh, at this point, uh, and really just to, so I'm not gonna try and summarise, but it's it, what comes out to me, I think, is that we're really at quite an early stage in this conversation. Uh, so although we can really see some opportunities, I think Norman really set that out for us. There are uh, quite a lot of concerns. Uh, we touched on skills as one. Uh, the fact that a lot of these applications are really still at the back office or kind of pilot stage, uh, they're quite narrow in their focus. And then a kind of much bigger story about kind of data monopoly and power concentration and actually how some of these things might play out in the long run. Uh, and I suppose I, I just from a kind of personal view, um, picking up Rob's question about aren't, aren't there too many bodies and the panel seem to be agreeing that there are, my own view is actually the opposite. So I, I'll just kind of end on that slightly controversial note that I think it's really good that the UK is taking this seriously, and I think we're fairly unique in doing that. To have two parliamentary inquiries going on, I did ask Norman, have you spoken to the Lords to make sure you're coordinating, and he says that they have. But I mean, those two inquiries are going to finish, they're, they're not new bodies, as it were. Uh, what I think is excellent is that the Nuffield Foundation has set up a new convention on data ethics, mirroring its uh, Council on Bioethics 20 years ago, which I think played a really useful role. Uh, and then the government is setting up the Centre for Data Ethics, as it were. So as long as they tread carefully, those bodies will, I think, add real value to the conversation. And the fact that conversations like this are happening as well, they really should be. AI is a pervasive public technology, as it were. It will cut across everything. And therefore, if there were one uber super regulatory body, it would be bonkers, right? I mean, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feed into healthcare, but it's going to feed into... <laughs>